agree for unbelief? That's right. What I want to do tonight is uh, share my testimony. And I'm well aware there are a lot of you here who have already heard my testimony. And uh, if you know something, that one of the most powerful tools that we've got today is how Jesus Christ changed life. Now I want to read something to you, and I don't want to be religious about it. Okay, so a little, a little article by somebody, and it's called Children Dying. Children dying. Twilight, the city lights burn in her eyes. She stumbles, recovers. She quietly cries. Childhood reflections flash by in her mind. The few caring moments she's known in her time. Alone in the darkness, she stares at the floor, wondering just why she has come back for more. Inside she trembles, she waits for the high. She empties a needle and what wishes to die. Out in the suburbs, alone in his room, stereo blaring, a soul chilling tune. He pauses to wonder just why he was born, when 15 years later, he's ending it all. Children crying, does anybody hear? Children dying, does anybody care? You know, I think that one of the great things that, uh, that's happening here with the tribe of Judah is that the tribe of Judah is not just a, a, a motorcycle club, it's an outreach ministry that is involved in trying to help people stay out of prison, trying to help people stay out of psychiatric wards, trying to help people stay off alcohol and drugs. That's one of the prime reasons that the tribe of Judah has been established, to reach people that probably wouldn't darken a church door. I want to read something else to you by a year 11 student. It's called, Please God. Please God tell me, are you Buddhist, Jehovah, or Jew? What's the color of your skin? Black, white, yellow, or blue? Why the blacks in the east have hollow guts and hungry eyes, but we still stuff our face with yellow cakes to French fries? When a gun kills a dozen in the busy Queen Street, why the banning of guns should be such a great feat? How a copper is taught to enforce our great law, but when they slip in the money, he learns to ignore. When seven astronauts die, coloured stories fill the age. But when hundreds die in India, there's not even half a page. Tell me why on my reports I rate a high B, but my inner self-happiness only marks as an E. God, please tell me the answers. Please tell them to me right now. Tell them in full. Tell me why, when and how. When you give your explanations, the answers better fit. And you better speak fast, because the train's about to hit. Rest in peace. Year 11 student from an Australian secondary school. Christianity. What does it mean to be a Christian? Being a Christian for me, it's been about having a new life. And when I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ 30 years ago, I had hair. I didn't have whiskers. I didn't wear this leather. And I was to get around in a suit and tie. And I needed to dress up in a suit and tie because I couldn't handle riding a motorbike. I couldn't handle a set of leathers, not where I came from. Because I've seen blokes get out of jail, buy a motorbike. They can't handle a motorbike. They go out and do something crazy and wind up right back in jail again. But about, five, about four years ago, three and a half, four years ago, when I was in Auckland, God clearly spoke to me three and a half years ago that it's going to change my ministry about. And that was amazing. Because you think that Australians are conservative, go to New Zealand, it gets worse. And I remember when I went into a heavy metal shop to buy a leather jacket, 
I've got a hope now from the church, sees me. Oh, thank God, excellent. So one week, the church saw me in a suit and tie, and the next minute, I rode up to a, a Pentecostal Assemblies of God church with a leather jacket on and a pair of leather pants and a pass of fruit. He says, what? And I says, well, God told me to, to make some improvements. <laughs> Take it how you want. But you see, when God tells you to do something, you do it. Amen. That's right. I was an alcoholic. I know I don't look like an alcoholic. But I was an alcoholic. A real alcoholic. I hate alcohol. I can't stand it. And one of the joys of being a Christian is to wake up in the morning with a clear head and not a sore guts after dry reaching down the toilet the night before. One of the reasons I came to the Lord Jesus Christ 13 years ago was because I was sick and tired. I've been sick and tired. Now I know I'm not the flashiest thing around or the greatest preacher around, but I do know this, that amazing grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was deaf, but now I hear. I once was a drunk, but now I'm sober. That's right. I was a drug addict. I got into drugs for the same reason I got into alcohol. Because I wanted to try and escape the problems of life. I was mainly on drugs up my arms. I used to put rubber hoses around the top of my arms here to get your veins out and stick a needle in there. I was on marijuana, mate. I used to have it coming out the ears. I was a pill addict. If anything, roll around on the floor and pick it up and I'd eat it. I was chemically addicted to pills. When I give a life to Jesus, I got addicted to the gospel pills. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And it's true. And you know, you, if you're sitting watching us on TV, I want to tell you, mate, that the only answer for it is Jesus Christ. Yeah, that, that stubby you've got in your hand there, they're going to do you no good. That bag of dope you've got in the, on your back porch in your gumboot, that's going to do you no good. I want to tell you what, man, only Jesus Christ can change your life. I used to drink Brasso. I used to put Brasso shoe bread and drink it when I was in prison. When you're in prison, you have any flash cocktail bar. You take what you can get. I used to go to massage parlors. I used to love going to bed with prostitutes because I couldn't find any decent women. <laughs> Because the places I went to, there weren't no decent women. So I used to go to the massage parlors and buy a woman for the night. Then when I used to feel really ugly, I'd go to church the next day and repent. And do the same old thing as before I was a Christian. I was a glue sniffer. I used to put plastic bags over my head and sniff glue. I used to sniff petrol. I spent five and a half years of my life locked up behind bars. That's not exaggerated. I've been to prison. I spent all my teenage years locked up behind bars. So if you're here tonight, or you're watching this on TV, and you might think nobody understands you, or you or the predicament that you're in, I want to tell you what, Jesus Christ understands your predicament, and I understand your predicament. There are others here tonight that understand your predicament. I was lonely. I drank alcohol and took drugs because I was lonely. It was easy to stick a smoke in your mouth or stick a needle up your arm or, or, or sniff some glue there to get out of it. But the next morning, you've got to face yourself again. It's a plastic high. And when I go to high schools, kids say, Well, man, dog, you know, don't you smoke anymore, dog? I says, I don't need marijuana, man. i got Jesus Christ, and he's a great high priest, and you can't get any higher than him. And that's true. You see, that's true, man. That's so true. That's the reason I don't smoke marijuana. Not because I've become a goody good. Nah, get that out of your head. I tried being a goody good man and, and I just now become a baddie baddie. Until I got born again. Then I became a goody goody. Really want you to know that tonight. When I got Jesus in my heart, I didn't need any more marijuana. It's the same with the alcohol. They call alcoholists and maloney mares disease. And I drank alcohol because I was lonely. And maybe there are people here tonight, guaranteed, where you're still drinking alcohol. 
You don't need alcohol, you need Jesus. That's right. Because if you still keep drinking alcohol, I want to tell you what, it'll pull you back. You sit in the barber seat long enough to get a haircut. <laughs> When I was 22 years of age, I nearly died. I was locked up in a prison one day, and I went out to the to the prison farm, and I plucked a big poison taste that I thought was a magic mushroom. And I ate it raw, and I washed it down the bottle of gin. That really happened. I'm not telling you any Kiwi bull. Just as good as Australian bull. Probably a little bit better. You've got more time to think about it. That's true. And the last thing I remember was walking back into the prison and four prison warders picking me up by my hands and my feet because I collapsed on the ground. And they carried me out of the solitary confinement cell where I nearly died. Do you know what it's like when you go to prison? It's terrible. You know, I hear blokes say, oh, you know, when I go to prison, I'm staunch. When you go to jail, it stuffs your life up. The quickest way to wind up in prison is get involved in alcohol and drugs. It's true. I was locked up 24 hours of the day. Every 20 minutes, a prison warder would come along and look in your cell. How do you feel about yourself? You feel like a dog. You feel ugly. They'd haul you out of your cell at 5 o'clock in the morning, strip all your clothes off you. How do you feel when you've got four grown men looking at all your private parts? You can't do nothing. Because if you say too much, they'll get a fist and bust your lights out. That's what happens when you go to jail. So, oh, I don't want to hear that. There might be some of you here tonight, you need to hear that. I've seen people come to these sort of meetings and backslide and wind up in prison. I water back to, I water baptize, help water baptize a guy at the Christ and Bass's motorcycle club about a year ago, and I was up in Townsville preaching in the Townsville jail, and this bloke behind the, one of the bird cages yelled out to me and says, Mad dog. And I didn't recognize him because he had a haircut. He says, Remember me? I says, Who are you? He says, Remember. You want to baptize me behind Christ's ambassadors. I said, what are you doing in here? He says, oh, I didn't tell you. I was on the run at the time. <laughs> sort of funny. I says, well, I'm having a meeting in the jail tonight. Want to come along and have a listen? You see? I was locked up in mental wards. Had it sounds. I wake up in gutters. I wake up in parks. I wake up in the Oakland police station. Naked, no clothes on. Got a broken beer bottle, slipped your wrist open one time so I can get Valium. I was locked up in maximum security in Parimarima prison, I was in Mount Eden prison, New Plymouth prison, White Carrier prison, Napier prison, Mount Crawford prison, and Chicago prison. I was in Oakley Psychiatric Hospital, Carrington Psychiatric Hospital, Tokenui Psychiatric Hospital, Pyrrhus Psychiatric Hospital, Cherry Farm Psychiatric Hospital. I had a couple of problems, watch yours. <laughs> But I'm sharing it with you, not so that you not just say that I'm trying to ego on my past, but for you to understand, it doesn't matter how rotten you are, it doesn't matter how many problems you've had, if you're willing to run into the arms of Jesus and you're sincere and you're upfront about it, Jesus Christ can change your problems. He can do it. He can do it. But it takes Jesus to do it. It takes guts. And it takes a willingness to turn. I get mothers come up to me and they say, Mad Dog, I've got a brother or a son or, a, or even a father. They got into Christianity, but they're back in jail. They were just as rotten as you. How come you made it? <laughs> Making it? Well, uh, you know what I say to them? You don't try Christianity, you've got to walk in it. You can't just wake up and feel rotten, man, and go out and do drugs and drink booze and go out there and hook somebody or break into a shop. You see, when I gave my life to Jesus 13 years ago, I was faced with the biggest challenge of my life, to go straight. You know, that wasn't easy. I didn't know anybody in the church. I always seemed to hang around with the clergy, or drinking tea with old ladies, or hanging around youth group. Come on. You know? That wasn't my scene. But 13 years ago, I walked into a church, and an old man came up to me, and he looked at me, and he said to me, Son, he says, if you'll stick around here long enough, you get your life changed. At the end of this meeting tonight, I'm going to have an altar call for people to get saved. I mean saved. I'm not talking about just playing church, but to be truly converted. I know a lot of people make decisions for Jesus, but I'm not walking in it. 
You know? Thousands of people pray prayers, but they still keep living the way they're living before. Still keep sleeping around. Keep smoking a cigarette. Keep drinking the booze. Keep getting involved in fornication. It stuffs your walker. Take it from an expert. I tried psychiatrists, social workers. I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Growth Groups, Life Life Counseling, Psychodrama. Like wires on the head and needles in my bum. I say Byron in those jails used to take six prison waters or drag me along the concrete floor because I never walked anywhere. At 14 and a half years of age, I was arrested for attempted murder of a social worker. I broke out of a, out of a juvenile detention centre, stole a teacher's car, broke into a whole lot of shops with, with three other blokes, got caught, got placed in a security block, broke out of there, attacked a, attacked a prison social worker, put a pair of boot laces in his neck and tried to kill him. I could have been in prison for murder today. That's the kind of anger and hate I had in my life today. You see, most of my friends that I grew up with in New Zealand are in one of three places. Many of them are doing life for murder today. That's true. Many of the blokes I grew up with in juvenile homes are dead today. And one prison I was in, nine committed suicide. You see, the devil doesn't show you that side of it. All Satan shows you, man, is go out and have a good time. Smoke, drink up, sleep around, party. You know? He doesn't show you what happens when you wind up that exercise yard. You can't talk to anybody in there. And you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning in some prison dormitory and you've got three, four grown men having a homosexual affair. How do you feel about that? You can't ring anybody up. You can't go to your wife. You can't go to your husband. You're locked up in there. I was in those scenes. I lived in mental wards. I know what it's like to wake up early hours in the morning and two grown men having a homosexual affair. Again, you feel ugly about yourself. I also was an arsonist. I used to love lighting fires. And I used to walk around with bottles of petrol in my pocket. And I used to fire bomb places. When I was in a mental ward, I set fire to a, to, to, to a great big garden shed in a mental ward. When I was in prison cells, I used to get on my blankets and put them in the middle of my cell and set fire to it. I used to worship Satan. I used to encourage other people in prison cells to burn themselves to death. I didn't care. I didn't care about nobody. At 17 years of age, I was labelled as having psychopathic tendencies. You see? That's where I came from. You know, today, I talk to nearly 70,000 teenagers a year. Why? Because people came into those prisons and went out into the streets and came in and told me, Kevin, the only person that can change your life is Jesus Christ. Now I got brought up as a Catholic. I go, I hate it. Church, I couldn't stand it. But I'm not here tonight trying to preach religion to you. Religion won't change your life. You can sit in the church, won't change your life. I went to church every Sunday when I was a little kid. I'd walk into church, clip on my wings, and sit there like a good little boy for one hour. Then after one hour, I'd walk out of church, unclip my wings, and big horns would grow out of my head. I hate a church. Church won't change you. You sitting in the lounge watching this video right now. Church won't change you. You can be a Catholic, you can be a Baptist, you can be a Methodist, you can be an Anglican, but it can be Mr. Nice and Mr. Ugly. I want to tell you what, the only person that can change your life is Jesus Christ. And what I'm telling you tonight while you sit and listen to this video is that when Jesus Christ comes into your life, he comes into your heart there. He takes away the ugliness. My father died when I was in prison. There are four types of people I hated in life. One was my father. And my, my father's been dead for over 18 years. And my father found it very difficult to show love. And I hold no grievances against my family. But I want to tell you what. The main reason that people go off the road, off the rails, is because they can't look after their kids. Don't call it. That's probably a good thing to say. If you're going to jump in a sack and have kids, make sure that you can bring them up. So I've visited enough juvenile homes and visited enough prisons to see the results of people that get together that have kids. They can't bring them up. And they end up getting in trouble with the police. That's what it all comes back down to. I had no love for my father. Grew up in a, I grew up listening to my, my father 
smash my mother up, police coming around, furniture getting smashed up, arguing, lies, a lot of other drama going on. And I used to creep down to the kitchen and I'd listen to my parents fighting. And I was only about six years of age, but I couldn't understand why they were doing it. Because when I was growing up, we were just taught to be seen and not heard. And I grew up in a poor family. I grew up where we went to bed at night time with my father's work coats because we couldn't afford nice blankets. And I used to get jealous. So when I grew up, I joined a street gang. And got around for my kids that, that had the same sort of problems. Never understood. The other type of people are hate to a policeman. Because I've been in police cell blocks and seen policemen bash up inmates. I hated prison wardens. Because I've seen prison wardens get grown men and smash them over in jail cells. And I hated male psychiatric nurses. Because I, I lived in security blocks and mental wards and I watched male psychiatric nurses get sick patients and bust their lights open. Now you would not understand these things unless you've been in these places. You say, well, do you still hate them? I didn't hate anybody. Now, because I got Jesus in my life. Amen. I had some things to sort out in my life, all right. Yeah. Welcome to reality. You don't come out of all that rubbish and don't have problems. But one day when I was in a prison cell, my friends, I had a good look at my life. And I was searching and searching and searching and searching. And you walk up and down that, that cell block talking to yourself. Think about how to kill yourself. Think about every rotten, disgusting, pornographic thing you can think about. Destroys you. Totally cripples you. Cripples your life. You've got no idea how dangerous it is when you wind up in prison. It destroys your life for good. And the only person that can break that pattern is Jesus Christ. I'm telling you right now. I dreamt about prisons for years. I'd wake up with nightmares, screaming, thinking I was back in prison. The loneliness of eat away at you. But one day, I picked up my pirate spoon and I wrote up on that prison wall, I don't live in a world without love. Love was what I was looking for. Yeah, I tried to fight it in sex. I related to everybody belly button down. Now, I don't mind standing here at night because you're the sort of crowd I can talk to about these things. You know, because there's some of you here tonight, you've got the same, you, 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 you still got the same problem. And I don't hold that against you. Because I know that if you've been in booze and drugs, and you've been in jail, that one of your prime problems you'll have is sexual lust. And I don't have to interview you to find that out. Because I know what I was like, even after I was a Christian. But I said to myself, I want to change. I want to change. It took a long time to get those areas straightened out in my life. What do you think about when you're in prison? Think about every disgusting thing you can think about. I thank God that I'm married today. Seven years ago I got married. He was sitting in the lounge listening to this video right now. Maybe you want to get married. Well, I'll tell you where I found my wife. I found my wife in church. And that's a miracle. Because I come from a family of divorces. And being an alcoholic, I found it very difficult to live with anybody. I couldn't even live with myself, let alone live with a woman. It's true. But I went out of relationships after relationships after relationships. And then one day, I said to myself, what's more important, Kevin? Jesus Christ or finding a woman? And I wake up and I said to myself, Jesus Christ. I'll live my life being a nun if I have to. But all I want to do is serve God. And that's what I did. In seven years into my Christian walk, God supplied me with my wife. It wasn't easy. I used to get engaged every week. Good looking bloke that I am. When I joined the church, I met all these nice women in there. And I thought, man, I would have to keep my eyes on the preacher. Now, some years out here, yeah, he's talking about me. <laughs> Why did I come to this meeting tonight? You know? But all they were doing is being nice. You've got to understand, when you come out of prison, you live with, you live, you live big, hairy, tattooed, Guys in jail for five and a half years, man, you know, come out, you know, wow, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> I remember a bloke in a Christian in a church come up and put his arms around me. He was just giving me a bit of brotherly love, man. I wanted to punch him out. They didn't like blokes hugging me. <laughs> That's some of the funny things, I suppose. 
But do you know something? When my father died, I was in jail. And the only time that prison wardens, one of the few times the prison wardens came along and, and called me by my first name, was when came and told me that my father was dead. I was in a jail in New Plymouth playing chess. And the prison warden said to me, do you want to go back to your cell? I said, yeah. So I went back to my cell. And I've never been one to squall and ball. And I sat down on my prison bunk, and it was a skinny cell. You could touch both walls. You put one hand on that wall and another hand on that wall. And I sat on my bunk, and tears started to roll down my face. It really happened. And I started crying. And I was confused, and I was empty. And I felt totally inadequate. And I remember going to my father's funeral there, escorted by a prison warden. You know? Never had the chance of saying to my father, hey dad, I've made it. I thank God that last week I sent your mother 50 bucks. Now, you know, I love my mother, although she lives in Perth. And God got away from me and says, honor your mother. And I kept thinking about it. I don't want to, I don't want to wait till my mother dies till I send her some flowers. I've never sent my brother 50 bucks before in my life. And God had to soften my heart. I couldn't love anybody. Didn't know what it was like to be nice to people. Had all these hangouts, all these problems, all these inhibitions. No education. Went to high school to eat your lunch. Written off by society. Written off by doctors. Written off by prison wardens. And I was. Jerry Walker seen my criminal record. Took two of us to hold it and put it through the fax machine. <laughs> to get me visa to go to America. But a change happened in my life. Thirteen years ago, I was asleep in a mental ward in Auckland. I was 26 years of age. My life was trash. I had nothing. Didn't even have a driver's license. You didn't need a driver's license in prison. No traffic lights. Didn't even know how to open up the post office account. Just had holes in my pants, man. Had nothing. And I got a letter. One letter changed my life. One letter. A lady wrote to me, and she said to me, Do you know that your own brother, who was an alcoholic, had been in prisons in New Zealand and Australia, has become a born-again Christian? I'd met born-again Christians. They all wanted to get me converted. But I didn't want to get converted. I was always looking for another way. But Jesus said, there are many paths which seem right, but there's only one path that can lead to eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. It's true. It's true. I ain't talking about some Bible school knowledge I got. I'm a practical person. It's got to work. For 13 years, I've been sober. So I know it works. I couldn't stop drinking, man, till I got squared up with Jesus. And I walked into that church, and I walked up in front of that church 13 years ago, and I said, Jesus, come into my life and change me. And I said, Jesus, if you're real, deliver me from alcoholism. And if you'll deliver me from alcoholism, said, deliver me from alcoholism. I said, if you deliver me from alcoholism, I'll spend the rest of my life giving my testimony. Now, I'm doing what I'm doing tonight, not because I'm on an ego trip, but because Terry Walker came to me and slipped me $100 or $50 and says, get stuck into them. Terry Walker, don't tell me nothing. He's a, he's, a, he's a beautiful brother of the Lord, and I love him. My faith. <laughs> But here tonight, because I believe there are people here that are struggling in areas in your life there. And if anything you get out of this testimony tonight, that you're not a failure. That Jesus Christ is interested in you. And don't get sucked into that trash in the world out there. This is the only way you can have a good time is sleeping around, getting into booze. I know it can be tough out there, but you've got to close the door, man. You've got to close the door to sin. You've got to close it. You look and you live another day. You look to be an old man. 
I remember my pastor coming up to me 13 years ago and he looked at me and he said to me, son, he said, or he said to me, Kevin, he said, I couldn't love you if it wasn't for Jesus. I said, pastor, I couldn't love you if it wasn't for Jesus either. But for the first time in my life, folks, I took the couple out of my ears. I wasn't a good listener. I liked to listen to things that suited me. I was a con man. I was a manipulator. I sell it all to the Arabs. Twist people around my finger. Caught up with me later on in life after I became a Christian. See, Jesus Christ will get you honest. That's what I love about Jesus. When you walk with Jesus, he'll cause you to change. The pagans out there didn't. I went to AA and, and Narcotics Anonymous and, and growth groups. They said you can still smoke and drink and, and, and sleep around, man, but just keep coming back to the programs. You see, when you, when you get involved with Jesus, He demands change. But He's graceful. And he's loving. And he knows you. He knows you like nobody else knows you. 13 years ago, I walked out of that church and I walked into a hotel. That's what really happened. I bought a 12 ounce glass of beer and I couldn't drink it. And that freaked me out, man. Because I didn't know what it was like being sober. And I walked out of that hotel 13 years ago and I walked into the Christian bookshop and I spent $75 on a Bible. When you spend $75 on a Bible, you're serious. I mean, you can get a few crates of uh, grog for 75 bucks. $75 on a Bible. And I went back home, and then I went to church, and I walked into church the next Sunday, and the preacher got up, and he preached from the Bible, and Corinthians 13, about love. And I sat on the front row of that little apostolic church 30 years ago, and I knew the love that I tried to find in sex and drugs and gangs and alcohol, that kind of stuff out there, man, I found in Jesus. Now, I didn't understand it, but I knew that Jesus had a plan for my life. Now, you might be here tonight and think, man, does God know my telephone number? Yes, He does. If He knows my telephone number, He knows your telephone number. You might be here tonight and think, I've got no education. I know education. Jesus Christ isn't after your education. Jesus Christ wants your availability to join His ranks. He look after your education. Amen. Amen. 13 years ago, a pastor came over and he laid hands on me. And God spoke to me, clear as a bell. And God said to me, my son, my son, I followed you from institution to institution. This night, I'm going to call you out and I'm going to send you back in to bring others out. That was amazing. The only thing I had going for me was a big mouth. And I worked it out. You give me a big mouth? You probably called me to be a preacher, be an evangelist. I wanted to help people, but I had nothing to help people with. I've got no skills. I've got no trade. I've got to get anything done. I've got to get other people to do it. But God give me a mouth. And I worked something out in life. I thought because I'm sober and I'm out of prison, I can talk to alcoholics. I can go to the prisons and tell them how to stay in a jail. And one day at a time, God started to rebuild my life. Dealt with my anger. Had a bad anger problem. I'm reasonably nice now. Back then, I used to get thrown out of home fellowship groups. Because <laughs> I like to go in a bar of people's stereos. Christians, we're family, aren't we? We should share. <laughs> and I was used to the jail mentality. In jail, you share. But I found out in the church, they like to go away and pray and fast about it for 40 days. <laughs> no, I uh, didn't have too much patience to wait for 40 days. But you know something? I thank God for the church. There are three lovers in my life today. You know who they are? I've got three lovers in my life today. Three lovers. Number one is Jesus Christ. I'm madly in love with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And I'm a fanatic for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs> Say, don't you love motorbikes more? No, I don't. I can give one eye about motorbikes. Got a nice ride in the harbour. But I don't worship those things. All they are is a tool. A tool to talk to people. I can never understand why people in churches 
failed to understand that they could reach youth if they went out and sold their car, man, and bought a Harley Davidson. They'd touch more lives for Jesus than they ever would in their lives. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that's worth a clap. I used to go down the streets on a Friday night and talk to street kids. Can I tell you this? You know how I dealt with my depression? I got involved in evangelism. And some days I'd wake up cranky, angry, bad mouthed, but I'm a Christian. You know what I used to do? Give me a bunch of tracks, and I'd go out on the street and I'd give out tracks. And after giving out tracks on street corners for half an hour, I felt better about myself. Because when you get involved in evangelism, it'll create around you a shield of faith. Amen. Me and Jerry Walker went into the into the mall last weekend and did open air preaching. That's tough ministry. But boy, you feel better about yourself afterwards. The devil hates it. The devil can't stand open air preachers. <laughs> We've got big crowds in the mall. Hundreds of people, all unsaved. Hallelujah. No invites, no red carpet. No, no, no music, nothing. Just ask in the Bible, praise God. See, it works, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It works, praise God. Now I'm 39, going on 40 years of age. I don't like hanging around the mall. I did that when I was 14, hanging around Woolworths. But I'll tell you what, regular evangelism, getting out where the people are, or get rid of the, the religious cobwebs in your life. But too many people are scared to do it. The devil will always fight you for that which could touch a nation the most. 13 years ago, I started evangelizing on the streets. Went right through New Zealand. I went back into prisons, mental wards. I went to the gangs, the black crowd, the mama mob. We got some real ugly dudes over there, man. Wild. Tattoos all over their face. <laughs> Me. But it doesn't matter. When you get saved, you get saved. And when you get saved, God gives you passion for souls. And the way I run my life, if I can't get out and talk to unsaved people, then my Christianity is not worth a table of salt. I carried a big cross around New Zealand. Mine was 12 foot long, 6 foot wide, and it weighed 80 pounds. I used to carry out the motorway on my shoulder and my wife would, would tow a caravan behind us. And I'd walk hundreds of kilometres with this thing till my feet blistered. And people would stop on the road and want to take me photo. And I'd tell them about Jesus. And I got in the papers and got on TV. You see, to overcome fear requires faith. But you have to step out of the comfort zone and have a go. You can't grow, you have a go. And you never know, you have a go. But you're going to hate sin. You're going to hate that lifestyle out there. And turn from it. And be committed. I've been the best 13 years of my life. I've ridden more Harleys than most. That's not bad for someone who's only been riding about three and a half, four years. I've been married for seven years. Plan on being married for the next seven. Got my own motorhome. Got a car. Got my own Harley. Got a nice $1,100 trailer. Praise God. All registered. Hallelujah. Take the throw down. For some of you people out there who have been down the seat, no, that's last on the list, getting vehicles registered. All my vehicles are registered. Got the money to pay for them too. Can take your wife out to a nice hotel for a meal. Never used to do those sorts of things. You see, following Jesus Christ, my friends, it's about reality. It's about good news. Hallelujah. And I'm one of the most happiest people in the world today. I am happy. Now, I may not walk out for laughing gear all the time. But happiness doesn't rely on your laughing gear. Happiness is on the inside there. Hey, Amen. I may not say much sometimes. That's because I do a lot of talking when I talk. Came to Australia three and a half years ago. That was a miracle. My brother was deported three times. I thought the devil had another mud foot in there. Came to Australia three and a half years ago as a miracle. Been to America. Got a beautiful
beautiful family in Europe tonight. Hallelujah. And I love you all. Praise God. Amen. Now, I, mean, I say that, praise God. But I mean that. The first person I'm in love with is Jesus. The second person is my wife. And the third person is the church. I love the church. And the more you grow in the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you start to appreciate your family. I don't care what they speak in tongues. If they speak in tongues like Presbyterian, Methodist, Anglican, Pentecostal, doesn't mean anything to me. I thank God for the body of Christ. Hallelujah. I love the church. Amen. That born again, I love the church. Hallelujah. I've grown to appreciate the church. Don't harden your heart to the church. I did for a while. Got hard. I says, God got a hold of me. He said, son, don't you worry about what people think about you. You work on what you think about people. And winding down tonight, if there's anything I can say to sum up tonight that I've had to work on, is attitudes. Attitudes, 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 attitudes. Attitudes. Comes right back down to attitudes. I had a bad attitude. Very dishonest. Not that I was going around knocking stuff off, but I was dishonest in my attitude. Because I've been hurt and rejected. Didn't like people getting close to me. And all these wrong attitudes. But I thank God that when I give my life to Jesus, He started to help me change those attitudes. It's not always easy. I ran from my problems. If there's someone I didn't like, I did two things. I told them. I tell them. But God got a hold of me one day and said, Son, you can't go around doing that anymore. I said, But I'm right. That person is a dog. You can see nothing about a dog. God was sitting there going, Sorry, son. You can't act that way anymore. You're just going to shut your mouth. Yeah. And that only happened over the last four years. God started to do major surgery on me. He started to try and look for the good in people. Because I didn't judge people because I've been judged. I didn't criticize people because I've been criticized. I didn't put people down because I've been put down. You can't live that way. Otherwise, you chase your tail, man. You go around and around and around and around. You die. Do you end up doing geographicals? I did it for years. It takes guts to face up. It takes guts to say, hey, I'm sorry. It takes guts to say, hey, I love you. Two of the most hardest words for some of us here tonight is to say, hey, I love you. Hello? I put my hand up for that one. But I do love you. It's not used to show them. You know? So tonight, what I've shared here is the truth. And like I said, I thank God that the tribe of Judah is a great organization. I'm not saying that to scratch Terry Walker's back, because I don't scratch people's back. I'm not a back scratcher. I'll tell that right now. I don't scratch people's backs. But if, they, if I feel I'm doing something that they need encouragement, I'll encourage them. The tribe of Judah is a great organization that's been raised up, I believe, with the, of the Lord Jesus Christ to reach people who would not normally come into a church. And we need churches where people can come in and feel at home. And that's why this has been raised up. And it's working. The fact we've got over a hundred and something people here tonight tells me that it works. I can bring anybody, any drug addict, any alcoholic into this sort of meeting. But there are churches that I couldn't bring them into. Nothing gets the church, just it wouldn't fit in. So you want to use this type of ministry to help break people into Christianity. It's exciting. Jesus Christ would have a Harley Davidson if he had a flesh body today anyway. And a leather jacket. Get rid of the silly idea that if Jesus Christ was alive today in a natural body, he'd be running around with sheep around him. He's coming back on a charger. <laughs> I do. But tonight, I want to finish and just, I want to pray for people tonight. Tonight, I want you to be honest with yourself. Tonight's the opportunity for you 
to make up your mind, are you converted? If you're not converted, you need to get converted tonight. And just hear me out this last 10 minutes. What are you waiting for? But you're in the lounge there. Sit in that lounge, watch this on video. I'm talking to you. I haven't forgotten you. I'm talking to you. Listen. Are you waiting until you're convinced? Are you waiting until you enjoy more of the world? Or maybe you're waiting for your friends. These are excuses. Maybe you're waiting until Christians are more consistent. Or maybe you're thinking the church is full of hypocrites. Why there's room for one more? But I want to tell you what, you've got more opportunity to get rid of your hypocrisy in the body of Christ than you would out there sitting in some stinking hotel crying in your beer. At least in here, you're going to get some truth. You're not going to get it in the hotel. You're not going to get it in the dope smokers out there. You're not going to get it in the massage parlors. Because the devil is a liar. The Bible says that, that Satan is a liar and a thief and a destroyer. And he'll blind you to the truth. Jesus Christ came to destroy the work of Satan. There is a place called hell. There is a place called heaven. And when you did, you did. Ten out of ten people will die. If you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? If you were to die in the next five minutes, where would you go? You say, I prayed a prayer. Big deal. You can pray a prayer and still go to hell, my friend. I'll say, to, I'll say that again. You can pray a prayer and still go to hell. I know a lot of people that pray a prayer. Just so they can get out of going to hell, man. And they go out there and they keep living the way they're living. It's gone quiet. Funny, that. <laughs> Maybe tonight you're waiting till there's not so much to give up. <laughs> Maybe you're waiting for a feeling. Maybe you're waiting until you're better. You'll never be good enough for Calvary. I don't care if you're Mr. Straight here. You never, you're that straight that can fire you in a razor blade. You wouldn't cut yourself, man. I want to tell you something tonight. Unless you're born again, you're going to go to hell. Simple as that. Maybe tonight you wait until you're sure you can hold out. Maybe tonight you wait for God's time. Tonight's God's time. Tonight's God's time. You're not here by accident. You're here by God incidents. You didn't plan to come here. If you're in this beaten house tonight, you're here because God brought you here. Don't ever kick yourself, man, to thinking that you made up your mind to come here. You didn't make up your mind to come here, man. You were brought here by the Holy Spirit. Like I've been brought here by the Holy Spirit. Tonight is born of God. This meeting is born of God. Because God wants to help you. He wants to see you do something with your life and stuff it up. Or maybe you wait until you die. To be born again is not generation. It's not baptism. It's not confirmation. It's not perspiration. It's not inspiration. It's not education. It's not renunciation. It's not imitation. It's not cooperation. It's not aspiration. And it's not inclination. And it's not fascination. You've got to be born again. Reborn. You've got a spirit man inside you that needs to be recreated. You've got to be born again. That's why I can talk to you tonight about Jesus, because I'm born again. Now, I was a Catholic, but I wasn't preaching. So the last thing I want to share with you tonight, I appreciate your patience.
seen boys fighting that for me. Okay, what I want to do right now is we're going to pray. We're going to pray one simple prayer tonight for people to come to know Jesus Christ, to be born again. The Bible says, They that shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here tonight, you're backslidden, I want you to pray the simple prayer with me tonight. I'd like every head to be bowed and eye to be closed. I'd like to ask the musicians to come up and... Uh, I want you to pray this prayer tonight. If you've never been born again, if you're smoking, there's going to be an opportunity tonight to get rid of your fags in your life. Now I know there are people who are friends of mine that smoke, but I love you. And I love you when you've got ten fags hanging out of your mouth. If your smokes don't, don't stop me loving you. But I, when I became a Christian, three months and I got rid of the fags. And tonight, I want you to seriously ask yourself, who do you love the most? Is cigarettes or Jesus Christ? You must have tried this a thousand times before. That's an excuse. Who do you love most tonight? Your alcohol or Jesus Christ? Maybe tonight you're involved in a bad relationship. You're chasing some woman or chasing some guy. Who do you love most? Ending up in bed or Jesus Christ? So tonight, I'm going to pray a prayer. And I want you to pray it tonight. Don't harden your heart. Every head bowed and eye closed right now. If you want to pray this prayer tonight, because you want to turn from that backsliding, turn from that problem in your life there, pray this prayer right now to yourself. Heavenly Father, I come to you tonight. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart right now and save me. Lord Jesus, tonight I repent and I turn from my smoking habit once and for all. I turn from my drinking alcohol once and for all. I turn from my sleeping around, chasing women, chasing men, once and for all. I turn from stealing. I turn from that life that's been pulling me down. And Lord Jesus, tonight, I say I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm turning from it tonight, Lord. And I'm going to walk with you, Jesus. And I'm going to be the kind of Christian you've called me to be. Whatever head is bowed and eyes closed tonight. If you prayed that prayer tonight to receive Jesus in your life for the first time, if you prayed that prayer tonight because you've rededicated your life to Jesus, in other words, you made a decision for Jesus, but you haven't been living in it, or you prayed that prayer tonight because you've made a decision to, to repent from certain sins in your life tonight, could you just slip your head up right now so I can see it, right up in the air. See that? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Just lift your hands up right now. Thank you. See that hand there? Young man. Others here tonight? You put those hands down. Anybody else here tonight? If you pray that prayer, yes, man. Others here tonight? Lift your hand up right now. If you pray that prayer tonight? Pray that prayer tonight. Anybody else? Just lift your hand up right now. Okay, we're going to have a song tonight, the band's going to lead us in a song, and we're going to stand, and tonight I'm going to ask all those people who lifted your hands to come forward tonight, and I, I want a, about a dozen counsellors to quickly come up, my wife and other people that, with the tribe of Judah, you're mature, okay, I'm going to ask you to come up there quickly, I want some counsellors to come up, alright, the counsellors stand to the front of the room here. What a half a dozen at least, or a dozen people. Quickly just, you know, my wife, my counsellors. Quickly can I have some mature people, quickly come. Charlie, would you come, you mature? Praise God. 
Elders here tonight. I just want you to line up here. Praise God. Hallelujah. They can ask you to stand, congregation. I just want you to face the audience. Okay. Okay, now, those tonight that have come to, to make that decision tonight, to repent of those areas in your life, or you've prayed that prayer tonight, I want you to come up out of your seat and come forward right now and come to one of these councils. I want you to bring your cigarettes and throw them on the ground. I want you to bring your cigarettes, cigarettes and throw them on the ground. Marijuana, pills, throw them on the ground right now. I want you to do that tonight. And the sin bin here. They got him a new car, and you might have liked it. Bring him forward and chuck him. Yeah, let's give him a hand All over this place tonight. I want you to do that tonight. Hallelujah. You got any weapons on you? Knives, guns? Stuff you get arrested for? There's all sorts of things. Would you bring him from in that sin bin tonight? Those that have come for prayer, I want you to come forward right now and come up to one of these councillors and I'm going to pray for you right now. Okay, so would you do that? Come forward right now. All those people, lift your hands, praise God. Hallelujah. All over this place tonight, pray. Come forward if you lift your hand up, praise God. There are some more councillors come up, praise God. Make sure everybody's got somebody. Hallelujah. Ladies, you can come if you're a mature Christian. Ray, you want to come up and do this? You coming up? Pray for John. Steve, someone pray for Steve over here. Hallelujah. Praise God. Would everybody have a counselor tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, just pray for Thank you, bro. Yeah, just pray for Steve. Thank you. Yeah, just pray for Steve. Thank you, Jesus. Let's reach our hands out, praise God, tonight to these folks. Let's lift our hands up. Reach your hands out tonight, praise God. Thank you for this anointing here tonight, praise God. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You're on the video tonight. You pray that prayer tonight. We love you. If you pray that prayer tonight, get in touch with the tribe of Judah. Because we can help you. Get in touch with the tribe of Judah here in Brisbane. Because we can help you. Others help you tonight. If you need that prayer, quickly come, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 